Hello, it's Jake. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is the first of two episodes on the subject of unjobbing. Unjobbing is about getting out of the rat race and finding a way to do what you love with your life rather than do a job that you hate to make a living. So it's a term that refers to sustaining yourself in ways that are in line with your values, finding a way to uh, earn money uh, but still do things that you love. And we'll be talking about a book called Unjobbing by Michael Fogler, which introduces uh, this idea. In the first episode, we focus on the ideas in Michael Fogler's book and the idea of unjobbing itself and talk about sort of the concept and how it uh, relates to ideas such as entrepreneurship and how it might be applicable. And in the second episode, a group of us who are interested in living the voluntary life talk about how unjobbing could be applied in our own lives and what, we've, what we're doing to work towards the goal of breaking free of career and of jobs and uh, creating a life only doing what we feel passionate about. That's something that I myself am now doing, so I'm really excited to be talking about unjobbing. I think it's a really important and interesting topic and I hope you enjoy the episode and thank you so much for listening. I'm just going to read this out because it's, uh, it really, really sums up the, the message of the book very well. So it reads, normal is getting dressed in clothes that you buy for work, driving through traffic in a car that you are still paying for in order to get to the job that you need so that you can pay for the clothes, car, the house that you leave empty all day in order to afford to live in it. I think it's a really good quote because I think about my life and I do think about how, you know, month on month, I, I budget month on month and uh, my outgoings are pretty much in line with my, my income. And so, you know, I don't, I'm not actually living a life with much financial freedom when you look at it that way. So if I can just simply cut back on my spending, then I'm much closer to living a freer life. So I've got, I feel more comfortable uh, with the risk of entrepreneurship if I don't have to stress about sustaining a very high, a very intensive lifestyle, if that makes sense. And so that, that's one thing that I, I really like about this book. Um, There's a very short summary of the point that you were making that he, that he talks about with, with the expenses, which is basically, the, he says, the, the, the central revelation of unjobbing is the more you can lower expense, your expenses, the more freedom will you, you will have to be the person you truly want to be. Yeah. And he views like tax as being also obviously something that you want to minimize because it's simply you're having to earn more to pay more tax and so forth. Yeah. yeah. So his idea is basically rather than, you know, make loads of money um, and in order to give yourself some freedom afterwards, mm -hmm. just basically lower your expenses as much as you can so that you can have as much freedom as, as you want. And I think the one thing I wanted to, it's just the thing that really struck me, which I thought was a part of that, the book that, that was really great as well, as, as well as that idea of lowering your expenses so that you can have freedom. He's got another, the, the other point he's making is that essentially freeing yourself from the social ostracism or norms around career building. Mm -hmm. And he basically says, that his, here's a quote that I thought was quite good. He says, um, this was the message, and it was a strong one, handed to us by society at large through our parents. The message was clearly this. Yes, you should try and be happy and fulfilled, but keep your life focused on your career. Perhaps we heard different actual words um, from the, than that from our parents and teachers, but each generation of children has been receiving the above message. Contradictory words make no difference. The cultural message of emphasizing career has been speaking so loudly that we would not be able to hear any other words. So the idea being that people get locked in to mm -hmm. career thinking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then, you know, what they're doing is, is just basically working to maintain right. their place within the rat race, essentially, rather yeah. than actually working on their own fulfillment and yeah. personal freedom. Yeah. But I guess because I come to this discussion of a career, sort of after spending a lot of time in therapy and journaling, trying to understand my own psychology and emotional hangups, I don't feel entitled to a career. 
And I, I speak to some people and they have like grudges against the previous employer who made them redundant. And they talk about this big, bad company as though they've ruined their life. Mm. It's like, since when are you owed? Like, mm. what, did you have some contractual agreement that meant that they owe you a lifetime career? It's like, no. Like, so what you're saying is that you, you got so uh, habituated to this one job that you're actually not living a very free life. So I don't, I don't feel entitled to, you know, the idea that I, I deserve to have one stable job my whole life. I don't think I'd even find that fulfilling. Yeah, I mean, I think he's talking about the fact that people then, not just that they feel entitled to the job that their company or whatever is giving them, but they also... Yeah their own self-worth and their own self-identity comes from being a lawyer or right. an accountant or whatever. Right. That's, that's who they consider themselves to be. Yeah. And so, you know, they're basically, you know, they're, they're completely bound up in that identity, right. which means that if they do lose their job, not only do they lose their job, they lose a whole chunk of who they are. Yeah. No, that's true. But I wanted to ask you guys, like, what do you think of the idea? I mean, what do you think about unjobbing? Is it, as simple as, and I'm so sorry if this is not right, as simple as, like, reducing your expenses, I mean, and, or, or finding, like, f f work that actually fulfills you instead of sort of maintaining a position? Or, I mean, is that what it is? I just want to make sure I understand. Well, uh, the basic idea is that your the prime goal is to just do, do whatever gives you happiness and work as little as possible. And essentially what he suggests is that the best way to do that rather than there's two things. One is rather than try and like earn big money to build up a surplus, he focuses more on just reducing your expenses to the absolute minimum. And he's got a whole load of ideas about saving money on, you know, transport and insurance and, and all these kinds of things. Um, and then the other idea is that the psychological barrier to doing that is, the whole self-worth that people have about their career. So, in other words, if you are a computer programmer or you are a software developer or you are whatever, then, you know, people have maybe have uh, plugged into demonstrating their worth through doing that in some, you know, tangible job. Whereas he suggests, you know, doing bits and bobs and freelance work and getting... Um, uh, more passive sources of income and other ways of supporting yourself that, you know, if somebody asks you what you do for a living, you might not be able to give them a very good answer, but it doesn't matter because the point is not to have a quote job, but to rather focus on getting yourself to a place where you can have uh, time to explore, you know, things that you feel passionately about or do things that you feel passionate. Right. right. One thought that I had as I was reading it was that it was sort of, um, survivalist light, and by that I, I don't mean it disparagingly, but it reminded me somewhat of the websites and books which advocate, you know, quote, living off the grid as a means of escaping state oppression. Uh, I, I didn't, I, I'm not saying I, I had the same um, oogie feelings that I do around hardcore survivalists, but it, it struck me as, um, uh, I don't want to say simplistic, but it, it really, I, I was sort of left wondering on a lot of specifics and perhaps a, a more close read will answer my own questions. But the, the few examples he did give of people who unjobbed, um, pretty much everyone did the, the standard, you know, dropping their expenses to below, you know, a certain level, taxable income, for example. But they all, uh, the one example that shined out to me was the person who owned a home who rented it out. I mean, that was a, that was a, probably a, a really decent revenue stream for them. So I, I'm not sure if, it, if I felt it was too simplistic or not. Yeah, I, I totally understand what you mean. You know, there was a little bit of, you know, I was reading and thinking, oh, so in order to do this, you're going to be wearing a sort of hemp shirt and uh, living, in, <laughs> living in a kind of grass shack or something, you know what I mean? Smelling up and truly. And, and I think that's... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to make a, a joke about living in a house made of tires or something. 
<laughs> yeah, that that side of it, that whole you know reducing expenses side, I I, I also had a few um, doubts about it. But in general, I have to say that for me, and I don't know what you guys think, for me, like I totally bought into the the idea that you need to build a successful career. I mean, actually, that's not entirely true because my career has gone all over the place. I've done all sorts of bizarre things, so maybe I didn't buy into it really. But what, I'm, what I mean is I think it is very strong in the culture that people do get defined by their jobs, right, and that they do, they do have a huge amount of self-worth invested in the job that they're doing. And for me, this book is of real interest because I've quit my job, right, and, I, and that means that that whole part of my identity is gone, and now I'm just me without the, you know, without the... The job identity and so i'm really curious as to what other people feel about it and at the moment i'm having a great time it's fantastic but i think it is an interesting one uh, like there's there's the financial challenge but there's also the the sort of i think there are a lot of psychological um uh, locks keeping people stuck in in the idea that they need to just keep uh, plugging away at their job because that's sort of what they what they've become you know yeah but there's one um chapter um but Page 31, and anyway, that I'm looking at that's uh, related to the subject. There's, there's two questions in this book that really sort of stand out to me, and I'll just read uh, part of this section just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So it reads, would we stay in our jobs if we did not need the salary? Uh, in addition, you might also ask yourself, does your work make the world a better place in which to live? And does your work fulfill your purpose of being alive here on earth so i guess what i think about is like well how would i ideally want to like make a living as it were and i don't know i guess like something something in in conjunction with my value like in what's the word incongruence with my values in concord with my values <laughs> what the word is, um like would be a start and i think the work the job that i'm doing now I am doing this sales job in in line with my values. So I'm I'm in sales, but I'm not pushy. So I solicit feedback. I talk about emotions, and I yeah, I'm actually human rather than a robot. And so like I think I'm in it's in line with my values, but it I wouldn't answer yes to any any of the, either of those questions. Mm. Like the value that I get from work is the paycheck. It's just the money, and so. I definitely wish I was living a different life, like and just doing something else. Um, and I'm not sure what, what that is right now, but I think reading this book and my excited thinking about different ideas and solutions as to what that could be. I definitely don't want to stay in sales my whole life. I have a, a, a general question that I'd like to throw out to people. I, I didn't get a chance to read the book, but uh, perhaps some people who have read the book or other resources on unjobbing can respond to this. If if the goal, the final goal is to sort of um, to be doing stuff that makes you happy one way or another, I guess there are two ways that you could go about it. One would be to you know reduce your costs and, and to minimize the amount of time that you have to work, right? And And separate work from stuff that you enjoy doing let's say like um if you're a programmer you know spending just 20 hours of work doing programming and then the rest of the time you're i don't know putting on musical that, that and that's what you're really passionate about and you you find you know you can't you can't spend all your time putting on musicals because you just can't find the market for it or whatever and then the other approach would be to try to turn your job into something that you love right and that's something that you, you hear a decent amount about in in, in popular culture and in mainstream society. So I'm curious about what would be the the unjobbing perspective on on the difference to those two approaches. Which one would be more preferable or realistic or whatever? I didn't follow what the two options were. One is to minimize the amount of time that you're working, and the other one is to turn your work into what you're what you really really enjoy doing, so that you don't need to bother minimizing it. Hmm. Yeah, I think I, I guess the argument he's making in this book is, and there is a quote in there somewhere about it was something along the lines of, if you do it for free because you love it so much, then it's not work anyway, right? Yeah. And, and the argument is that's what you should be doing. And I mean, I guess like I think it's a really interesting question that you ask yourself because I I definitely came from the first 
way of looking at things in certain, certain respects. I mean, I, I have, I've been interested in the idea of getting out of the rat race for 15 years at least and thinking about how to do it. And the way I thought of doing it was to basically to try and earn as much as I could through entrepreneurship and so forth. And also I was doing entrepreneurship in a field that I did feel passionate about and I was interested in. So that it wasn't, it wasn't just that, but it was definitely, I was thinking more in terms of how am I going to earn this much in order to then be able to have freedom as opposed to his view, which is just more like reduce your cost to an absolute minimum because that stuff doesn't fucking matter anyway. And you should just be loving your life and enjoying doing the things that you want to do. And that approach, you can sort of start tomorrow in in a certain degree. Um, But, of course, it does bring up the sort of point that Dave said, which is, well, does that mean that you're basically sort of like swampy living in... (laughs) (laughs) Down by the river. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And, you know, so I've gone for the... the, um, I've gone for the approach of like trying to do it with enough. To, I don't have to live in woods, you know. What I mean? right. <laughs> um, but still, uh, like I think obviously the both end up in the goal. The goal has got to be doing what you love all day long. Yeah. And if yeah. you can do that with more money, great. But I guess he's making the point that if you can do that with less money too, then mm-hmm. the material things are not ultimately life's too short to worry about. You know how nice your car is or whatever yeah he does identify and thanks for your clarification as well um he does identify that everybody is different so everyone is going to have a different take on answering that question some people would prefer one over the other um so i guess what what i've noticed in the book is really i've realized how i've um built up a stock of wealth that's not financial, I mean, hell, I'm in debt, but I've got, uh, he sort of redefines wealth and you sort of think about what kind of wealth that you can accumulate in your life. And like self-knowledge is like one that I've been spending like the last three years, like accumulating. And that's something that is like so immensely valuable that um, it's, I don't, I don't know, like even though I'm spending, I need to work more in order to afford a therapist, for example, like it's worth the investment. And so I, I don't know, everyone's got, everyone is going to have a different, a different take on answering that question. Like you might, you know, even want to transition into trying something new, like before trying, uh, going freelance, you might want to try going part time in your current job and using the rest of your free time to experiment. I mean, for example, if you cut down your expenses by half, then you've got, you know, the rest of, then you you can afford to go part-time and still, like, sustain your lifestyle from that one job. And then, you know, you can can do the rest in a stress-free environment. That's what, like, one solution to, if you feel ambivalent about answering that question, that would be one solution as to how you could work out what you prefer. I think there's, there's one, it reminds me of a, a definition of wealth that I think is in the book. Um, I don't know if you heard of the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I've, I've read it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, he defines wealth in, in a really interesting way. And like he says, um, I don't remember the exact wording, but what I took from it was um, wealth is the amount of time no, sorry, this is personal free. I think freedom or wealth or whatever. He defines the amount of time that you have until you have to do work that you don't want to do. So in other words, like if you're, if you're living a very high expense lifestyle, right? Right. You've got, you know, expensive house, car, this, that, and the other, right? Yeah. Then you may have all this stuff, but you still have to go out and work in order to maintain the lifestyle yeah, yeah. unless you've got, you know, super income enough to, to keep going. So, so you basically, if you choose your level of expenditure at a level where, you know, you can have a long forward gap until you have to go and do work that you don't want to be doing, then you could either do that by having savings. So you are just simply not working or you could be doing it by, doing income producing work that you love and that you do anyway, but even if it's free, right? Mm-hmm. In which case that keeps you going. But the basic idea is that, you know, you sort of choose your level of, of 
of material expenditure, but the real test is how long can you enjoy your life until you have to go back to work doing something you don't like? And if Monday morning is the answer, then basically you're doing a job that you don't like, right? And, yeah. But if, you know, if it's like, well, I've got savings that would last me for six months, then six months is the answer. But if it's like, well, I work three days a week doing something that's great fun, I love it, and I can, on that, that pays the rent or, or whatever just enough so that I can keep doing that for 10 years, then it's 10 years is the answer, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and either way, you've just got to choose, like, at what level of, you know, living in the woods versus luxury am I prepared to settle for or, or works for me or works for whatever I want to do in terms of, you know, having children and all that kind of thing with things that cost money. Then, you know, then once you've got that, that that's, the, that's the measure. It's, it's, um, it's, you know, basically how long can you go without uh, doing stuff you don't want to do? Mm. Yeah, I, I think the other thing that I, I got out of, I was really getting out of the book was how, yeah, like you mentioned, I mean, kind of like living, the, the comparison of living the, uh, the kind of the low, the lifestyle, he, like having a situation where you're not making as much money, but you have more time versus making a lot more money, but then your expenditures are high. I mean, I, when I look at my, my family, um, I mean, I could totally see, like, the, the situation in terms of freedom of time and, and how kind of a higher cost of living, a higher cost of living, like, makes things so much worse. I think my dad used to, uh, he, he got a, a much higher paying job a couple of years ago and, you know, suddenly wanted, like, a, suddenly got a new house and, and it's been like he's now been having trouble kind of paying that house off and he's so much more stressed than he was in the past when he was making just enough in a small house but had time for other things um i think the i think the other thing that um along those lines that that just came across to me because i talked to my dad about i mean why does he do that i mean because i don't think he particularly enjoys higher luxuries but i mean in reality my family there are people in my family who are very judgmental towards, you know, the size of the house and the, the, how the car is. And certainly when you live in a, other, a nice community, everybody else has got nice cars and nice furniture, and then you kind of feel the obligation to do that as well. So, I mean, I really felt like reading this book that, I mean, if you want to kind of take the jump in terms of, you know, having – you know, less expenditure and more freedom, which sounds like a great idea. You, you also have to make sure that the people around you, um, that, that you put people around you in your life that, that, that aren't so superficial about some of that stuff. Because um, when I look at my family, I mean, I see my dad, it's really the people around him, rel other relatives and so forth, that kind of have the idea of like, all these nice things are important. And because he values their judgment, he feels he subconsciously feels this kind of force to to live that kind of lifestyle and entail all the stress with it. Um, and so I think in that regard, I mean, just being psychologically, you know, sound and and being like, I don't care what other people think about this. I just care about what makes me feel, what makes me happy. I mean, I think that that that's something that I kind of another thing I kind of got out of this. Yeah, and those people, I mean, they will hate you for it if you if you demonstrate that you don't really need to stress out and and uh, and do the rat race because obviously it invalidates their choices and and they're making stressful choices. Yeah. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You've got to get the right around you because otherwise they will absolutely um, make sure that you know that they keep trying. Um, try and keep you in line and prevent you from, from enjoying that choice because in doing so, you kind of embellish for them. I mean, it's funny. It's like even simple things like I, the amount of meetings that I went to where, you know, I've never owned a car. I've just never owned one because it's London. I mean, what would be the point of owning a car here? It's completely, it's super expensive and, you know, you can't park it anywhere anyway. And it's a high density city with loads of transport. And in order to get around, you, you've got to take public transport anyway. Mm. So I just, I've never thought there'd be any point in owning a car. I can understand it if you've got kids and you live like way out of town, but in meetings right in the middle of London with people who work in London every day, 
you know, the conversations people have about what car they've got. Yeah. And it always, it was, I always just thought, it's just bizarre, you know? Yeah. Why do you own that thing? It's a complete waste of money. It can be a status It's a social status, status symbol. Yeah. And, and, and it's all about, yeah. like, look how hard I've worked. I'm now, I'm the guy who owns the, I also think I never understood what they were talking about because they always talk about, XR, this one. I don't know, I don't know what that means because I've never owned a car. <laughs> so I'd be like, oh, right, um, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but it's like, you know, yeah, and if, you, if you if you demonstrate it. that that is all just a complete waste of time, yeah. they'll hate you for it because they're working like their asses off in order to maintain that. Yeah. yeah. And I'd also imagine that if you live a life where you're actively cultivating values, like that you that are really important to you like you know community and like honesty and uh, things like this then rather than you know sort of uh exchanging your sort of life energy as it were for money at, at, a, at a business at a, at a workplace where you don't really want to be then I think you're also going to attract into your life people who share the same values. So, I mean, for starters, you're going to, I'd imagine, spend a lot more time interacting with people who share the same values as opposed to going to people who you feel alienated from. Like, these idiots who talk about the car. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. that's, what, that's what I'm talking about. I would be really interested to hear, like, uh, to hear other people's thoughts about getting out of the rat race. You know, is this something that you, is this just something that, that is on your mind? I mean, do you think about that? Is it something that's important to you? Is it something, because cause it's certainly like, I've spent a lot of my life, like with this as a really big goal. Yeah. And, you know, it, for me, this is, so I'm, I'm really curious. Is, is it something that, can you see yourself trying to go unjobbing in your own way? And if so, like, um, have you thought about it? So I'd love to hear other people's thoughts. Um, well, I'll just uh, share my thoughts on it briefly. Uh, I, I've certainly thought about it for a while now. Um, for me, uh, the idea of, of unjobbing at the moment means um, finding a, a, a sort of career path in which I have I, I like to work for myself. Um, I'd like to be doing something that I'm really interested and passionate about and where I can sort of modify the amount of work that I'm doing according to what my expenses are and my, my needs for funds and stuff like that. Um, so my focus is on then trying to figure out what that area is where I can find my niche in the market and be valuable and really enjoy the work and trying to uh, train myself uh, on my own time to to do that outside of my my regular work right now, so that that's what I'm trying to work towards. Awesome. The goal of uh, leaving uh, the the nine to five has also been something that I've had on and off as priorities in my life as well. But uh, one of the things that's always kept me from making the leap is uh, not really being able to find. That sort of um, that bullseye idea that I can really get passionate about, and so uh, one of the things that piqued my interest is something you said that this author had mentioned about um, just sort of doing a, rather than one sort of big thing like a collection of things, like more or less whatever it takes to keep you in vittles, right and one of the and and this was an idea that uh, uh, Charlotte and I have been bouncing around just independently now for a couple of months is this idea of just sort of picking four or five different smaller ideas that are revenue generating and seeing if we can make a go uh, that way. But what I'm curious about is does he go into any sort of practical details about uh, how to deal with um, like money management and um, making time for all of these things and scheduling and how to deal with sort of the the, ver the inevitable variability of income that's going to result from that kind of uh, lifestyle. My understanding is from what what he wrote is he's, he has a lot of suggestions about saving money and some quite good suggestions too, I mean, very good ones. And then he offers 
you know, some thoughts, but he also offers kind of like a couple of questionnaires about what your sort of strengths are and what you could potentially do and so forth. In terms of, you know, sources of passive income and ideas, I mean, he does give examples from his own history. I mean, obviously he wrote a book. So that's quite a good. Yeah. <laughs> in, what he's in the project itself, yeah. it's a form of passive income. Um, he does give some examples from his own life because he never really had a career and just did bits and bobs all the time. So, so the author has actually done this for himself as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, he's living the dream. He's living the dream. He's unjobbing. He's unschooling, and you know, I'm sure he wears sandals. Which you be sure. Yeah, she man. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, here we go, Greg. There's a page called Summary of Your Basic Plan. And it boils down to three things, right? The first is a conscious personal economics plan. And yes, sorry, he does have suggestions about that. He goes into um, basically how to do an inventory of your income and outgoings and planning for it and so forth. It's not super sophisticated, but he does have some suggestions about that, about your economics plan. I was just going to say, the less sophisticated, the better for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, he, and he has that. I mean, it essentially involves looking at what you're spending, what you're earning, and where the gaps are, and how you could save money, and what you could make more money from, and so on and so forth. And it's just like his, his suggestion there. The second one is a self-inventory, and that is about asking yourself questions. And he's got like a bullet point list. Who am I? Why am I here on earth? What do I value? What do I truly need in my life? What do I consider essential to have in my life? What are my resources? Examples, do you have savings? Do you own property? Do you have an uncle who's willing to repair your car for a meal? And, and he has all these like, different things like that. What are my talents and gifts? What are my joyful activities? So basically, the self-inventory is like all your potential sources of revenue and, and what you, and, and more importantly, where you're trying to get to, right? And then that, the third that one. That was pretty cool. Yeah. And then the third <laughs> one is imagine your ideal life. And um, he says, this is the fun part, and it's also dead serious. If you had no need for money, what would you be doing? How would you be spending your life energy? And then he goes into a bit more detail about that. And then essentially, <laughs> the plan for unjobbing is use number one and number two to move towards number three. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, use your conscious personal economics plan and your self-inventory to get to the point where you're living your imagined ideal life. I think it's the, you know, it's the Nike just do it um, <laughs> part of the plan. <laughs> Indeed.